Welcome to a National Science and Technology Week open house. From Murray Hill, New Jersey, by satellite, this is live from AT&T Bell Laboratories. For the next hour, meet some of America's foremost scientists. Visit laboratories where the frontiers of communication science are pursued. Talk with a U.S. Senator. Take orders from a crew member of the Starship Enterprise. Listen to one loquacious robot and rock and roll. Now here is the host of our program, David Heil. Hello and welcome to a live from AT&T Bell Laboratories. We're here at the Murray Hill facility of Bell Labs in a rather spectacular looking laboratory, as you can see from uh, the background here. We're going to find out more about the equipment in this laboratory a little bit later in the show. With us today are 60 students and teachers from the Morris School District. Uh, welcome, everybody. All of you gathered in here. We're packed in pretty tight. And we also have with us, scattered about that crowd, uh, about a dozen or so research scientists from Bell Labs who have joined us today and also joined us earlier in taping some of the segments for this program. You're going to hear from them and meet them more later. Sitting on my left is one of those scientists, uh, Vice President for Research here at Bell Labs, Dr. Arno Penzias. Hi. Welcome, Arno. Hi, and welcome to Bell Labs. Now, obviously, Arno, in your role here, uh, you're, you're well known in the science field, and uh, you have a recent book uh, out, uh, Ideas and Information. But you also have had the privilege of being honored with a very prestigious award in science, the Nobel Prize for Physics, along with six other scientists here at Bell Labs. Can you take a moment and share with us a little bit the history of Bell Labs and, and what makes it the special kind of place that uh, not one but seven Nobel laureates would be working here? I think the thing that makes Bell Labs the special institution that it is uh, has a lot to do not just with uh, seven people who happen to get lucky and get particularly famous, but the fact that there are thousands of researchers uh, and developers who work together in a large team trying to produce uh, the equipment which is going to produce the knowledge, for the, the knowledge base for the future, the technology, the science, and the understanding. The fact that we've got uh, a unique job makes this, job, makes this uh, place so exciting and interesting. And the people here, uh, uh, who are here because they want to be, they're attracted by, the, by, by those challenges, and also by the people who are here already. Now, how many scientists total are we talking about? Something over 20,000 scientists, of wow. which perhaps 1,000 uh, work in the research organization. The rest uh, work in what we call development, design for manufacture. So they would be designing the switchboards, the telephones, the computers, the other stuff you know with AT&T labels, and of course also to make our long distance network work. You bet, so it's a mixture of product development and just sheer basic research. A lot of things, and, and stuff in, and uh, a lot of things in between as well, sure. Terrific, Arnold, thanks so much. Obviously, Bell Labs is your home base. Now the rest of us here in the room today have quite a bit of catching up to do. And fortunately, a few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to uh, join some of the students who are here with us today in a tour of Bell Labs. So we want to share with you right now a few of the highlights from our tour. This Hollywood reenactment of the discovery of the telephone conveys the excitement of its somewhat serendipitous creation back in March of 1876. But this was only the beginning of a device that would change the world forever. Number, please. Thank you. Less than 50 years after Bell and Watson supposedly danced around the room, some 15 million Bell telephones were in use in the United States. Long distance lines interconnected cities and towns in all parts of the country. In 1925, a research branch of the American Bell Telephone Company became Bell Telephone Laboratories. The defined purpose of this research facility was, and still is, to do everything it can to advance the arts of communication. Since then, Bell Labs has been the birthplace of countless inventions, one of the most famous being the transistor, which made the information age possible. For the past 65 years, research at Bell Labs has covered every corner of science and society, including high-speed computers, data networking, far-reaching voice and video communications, the exploration of outer space, and superconductivity. Seven scientists at Bell Labs have been awarded Nobel Prizes, the highest scientific honor in the world. This is a prestigious place, a facility where leading-edge research attracts some of the best scientists in the world. 
I was excited that the students and I were getting a chance to visit some of the actual laboratories where frontier technologies are being discovered and advanced every day. Hello, Dave. Welcome to AT&T. Welcome to AT&T. I think it's for you, Heather. <laughs> Arlene, this isn't exactly what I had in mind when we uh, decided to visit uh, one of the number one communication systems in America here. What is this? Well, this is just basically a... Um, no, the tin can telephone is not a Bell Labs invention. But understandably, most of the research done at Bell Labs is related to telecommunications. Our first stop was the Optical Computing Research Department, where researcher Marlene Downs showed us some of the ways phone calls make their way across the country. Wow, this is a phenomenal piece of cable. So what's, what's actually inside here? Okay, in here we have um, 900 pairs of wire, and that takes copper a, wire. Copper wire that takes a signal to your home. And on these 900 pair, you can get around 10,300 uh, voice conversations simultaneously. Woo! One town's worth of phone calls right there. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's heavy. And it's really those, heavy. those are normally underneath the roads of, your, of, of the town that you live in. This system of transmitting voice messages obviously worked for a long time. But the future for sending all kinds of communications, telephone messages, television signals, and computer data, lies in glass fibers that transmit information with pulses of light. This is old technology, and this is our new technology, right? And, and, and the amount of inf the, another reason why we want to go to fibers is because of the bandwidth, how much more voice conversations you can actually send down this thing. So it makes everything lighter and smaller, and everything's a lot nicer at the other end also. And for comparison, while the old bulky wire cable carried about 10,000 conversations at once, a pair of fibers like this one will soon be carrying 300,000 simultaneous phone calls. So it looks like dental floss. Yeah, it does. It looks like dental floss. I don't think you want to try this in your teeth, though, Dan. <laughs> Our next stop was the laboratory where scientists like Frank DiMarcello produce test fibers and investigate new ways of making them more durable and reliable. This lab houses the draw tower, a 29-foot tall contraption that pulls the fiber into an ultra-thin strand, about the size of a human hair. The fiber starts out as a solid glass tube called a preform, which is inserted into a 2,000 degree centigrade furnace at the top of the tower. As the tube heats up, a glob of molten glass drops out of the furnace. From here, a strand of the glass is drawn down and threaded through guides that will coat it as it travels to the spool. The primary purpose of the coating is to protect the surface from getting damaged. Glass inherently is very strong, but you must protect the surface from scratches or any sort of defects. If this were a manufacturing plant, the fiber might be used for underground or undersea cables to transmit telephone calls. But the fiber made here at Bell Labs is used in research by scientists like Daryl Innes, who are looking for new ways to extend the fiber's 25-year life expectancy. This is a two-point bender. And if you look closely, you'll see that there's a fiber sitting between two parallel aligned faces. Mm -hmm. And what's this little fiber that, that's uh, stuck in between there? Okay. That's our standard silica fiber. And what we do is we drive these two faces together. I can do it with this micrometer. And as the faces come together, the fiber Whoa. breaks. It is strong, though. Yes, oh, it's very amazing. strong. And the strength of the fiber is inversely proportional to the separation between these two faces. And that all gets calibrated by the computer, obviously, as this, part of the, the data collection. That's right. This gets calibrated by the computer. In fact, if you look closely, there's a transducer right here. When the fiber breaks, there's an acoustical emission, and it's picked up by the computer. It tells the faces to stop, and it knows the separation between the two faces, and it can calculate the strength based on equations the that... acoustical yeah. emission. So how many of you guys heard it when it snapped, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't notice it. During experiments, Daryl submerges test fibers into simulated environments that a fiber might be exposed to, such as extreme temperatures or chemicals. But sometimes, the environmental threats to the fiber are unanticipated. When the first undersea fiber optic cable was laid between the Canary Islands, a short circuit interrupted service a month after installation. The problem was not in the fiber. It was sharks. They were biting into the polyethylene coating that protected the fiber bundles. Scientists soon developed a new shark-proof cable, and so far, so good. All right, John, you invited us in to show us this wonderful apparatus here. It's an it's a elegant piece of equipment. What does it do? Uh, it's a 10-ton vacuum chamber. 10-ton um, vacuum chamber. Scientist John Bean may think of it as a simple vacuum chamber, but it's also known by a much more scientific name, molecular beam epitaxy. 
Inside this massive container, scientists can build new materials an atom layer at a time, kind of like spray painting a surface with atoms. A vacuum is necessary to ensure near absolute cleanliness. Contamination from a speck of dust or even oxygen in the air could ruin the final product. And this is, in terms of hardware, a very complex way of doing something very, very simple. We take a piece of silicon, a nice piece of semiconductor. We heat it up so that atoms of silicon evaporate off of it and strike a silicon wafer upon which we want to go to an electronic device. Single atoms will evaporate Sing off of this. A stream of single atoms. Plate. And we can control how many atoms come off in a, in a given time by controlling the temperature of the silicon charge. And all of this goes on inside this apparatus. And inside you can see we've got a heater up there which, which is growing or, glowing orange right now, which would be heating the silicon wafer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. great. All right, here's the obvious question. Why would you want to control how thick that gets laid down on the wafer? Okay. One is if, if the layer is thinner, things happen faster. I mean, just an electron can get through the layer faster, so the thinner it is, the faster the device is. That would make a faster operating faster. wafer. Okay. The thinner it is, the smaller it is, so we can grow more devices on a given wafer. This technique could revolutionize communications and may lead to even more powerful high-speed computers. And it's proving to be a tool for discovering more about the basic physics of growing crystals. I can't get to the destination. I'll try to clear the way for the short, soft yellow round cone by storing the small, hard white round bottle in location 3. This is a 450-pound, 5-axis, Cartesian coordinate robotic arm, otherwise known as SAM, an acronym for Speech Activated Manipulator. SAM is able to respond to directions from its commanding officer, if you will, scientist Mike Brown. Well, Sam understands 193 words, and that works out to about 60 duodecillion sentences. Now, that's a six with 40 zeros after it. So a number a, I don't use very often. <laughs> a large number of sentences, and he can understand a lot of different uh, possibilities of uh, commands and questions. We can Sam is able to understand verbal commands spoken by Mike over a telephone. Sam then uses an ultrasonic rangefinder that can detect objects much like a bat uses sonar to find its way in the dark. This is one of the ways Sam is able to see, so to speak, the various items on the table. Sam also has touch sensors that allow it to feel and pick up an object. It can understand relative positions like right and left, front and back. And Sam can remember the last location of each object and will reposition the objects if one is in the way. Move the red object to the right of the cone. I know of two red objects. A shiny hard red round object and a tall soft red round insulator. Please uniquely specify one or say ignore and we'll try again. The shiny object. Going for the apple. Good choice. Did you notice that Mike did not tell Sam to move the apple, but to move the shiny red object? That's because the word apple is not in Sam's vocabulary. AT&T isn't in the robot business. But from SAM, researchers are learning a lot about machine intelligence, sensory perception, and other elements of robotics, which will lead to better communications between people, computers, and machines in the future. SAM isn't really intended to be a product, per se, although you might use something similar to SAM, like a um, bomb disposal robot, for instance, where a policeman could call the uh, robot up on a telephone and talk to it in ordinary English and tell it to go down the hall and turn to the left, maybe even open a door and go inside and look at a bomb and perhaps pull out a screwdriver and actually start doing something. If the bomb explodes, well, the robot's gone, but at least the human isn't uh, hurt. Most of the places we visited at Bell Labs are doing the kinds of research that will result in a product, a better telephone, a life-saving medical device, or a faster computer, perhaps. But there are some scientists here who are working, or have been working for years, simply on an idea, maybe even a crazy idea. The end result may not be a product that we buy in the store, but rather a better understanding of science and how technology works. Now, I don't know about the rest of you, but when I saw Sam, the first thing I thought of was, I'd like to get a cousin of Sam to come over to my house on the weekend to do a little house cleaning. What do you think? <laughs> One of the opportunities that we have in the program today is to ask questions of the scientists that we have with us, in particular, Dr. Penzias sitting on my left here. Uh, I'm going to start the process off with a question that came to us uh, through another mechanism, the AT&T Learning Network. This particular question is from Christy Laven, a sixth grader from the Washington Borough Public Schools in New Jersey. And she sent this uh, email message to us. What would be the most important personality trait for someone going into the sciences? Arnold, I'm going to toss that to you. Okay. I'd say it'd be curiosity. 
the desire to know something that you don't know, how something works, why something is the way it is. Uh, the kind of thing that three-year-olds do instinctively, and the rest of us, uh, I guess, have to relearn. So curiosity is right up on the top of this. Where's humor fit in? Uh, yeah, once I was, in fact, <laughs> when he asked me yesterday, uh, he asked me that, I said, uh, sense of humor. I think you have to, I think you, not, you have to take your job seriously as a scientist, but you don't want to take yourself too seriously. That's fair. All right, now we're all going to meet somebody to whose science is everything. And folks, I mean everything. Hi. My name is Gordon. You can visit me at the AT&T InfoQuest Center in New York City. You're probably wondering why I went into science. Well, it was obvious to me that a career in football was out. Besides, a lot of science went into me. Before I went to robot school, all I knew about scientists, I got from watching the movies. Some of my ideas were pretty weird. You can see why a career in science looked pretty interesting to me. Why did the people at Bell Labs choose science careers? Here's what they told us. I guess the reason I'm a scientist uh, today is because I never wanted to grow up. When you're a kid, you get to ask questions all the time. And they pay me to do that now. It's the best fun I've ever had. Actually, nobody really knows the way things are. And what you do when you actually are a scientist is you, you take this little piece of something that no one understood before and you work on it until you understand it finally. It's just, it's just a lot of joy to go into lab and to try to put things together and to uh, uh, make, things, make things work. Math was sort of intangible and it wasn't applied and it wasn't until high school when I started studying a lot of the chemistry and the physics where I suddenly realized that this is, this is how mathematics is applied and that was very exciting because it gave me a chance to use what I was good at but actually apply it in the real world. It's fun to be able to, to have the feeling that you can change the world. The greatest thrill you get as a scientist is a few times in your life you'll get an insight or you'll get an understanding or you'll see an effect that nobody's ever seen before and you walk around for a few hours or a few days or a few weeks and you say, I'm the only one on the planet who knows this or I'm the only one on the planet who understands that and that feeling of knowing what's going on and, and having figured out something that nobody else has figured out yet is, is really exciting. One of the keys to success in any career is reading. There are so many good books on science that we asked the Library of Congress to recommend a few books for you. Send your request to Live from AT&T Bell Laboratories 101 JFK Parkway Short Hills, New Jersey 07078 Now, back to David Heil. Thank you so much, Gordon. The perfect neighbor of the future, I would say, wouldn't you? <laughs> you can see Gordon at the AT&T InfoQuest Center in downtown New York City, obviously, on the corner of Madison and 56th Avenue. They have three floors of incredible interactive exhibits down there. It's a wonderful place to visit uh, with your students or with your family sometime. Don't forget, if you uh, want that list from the Library of Congress, we'll have that address up again later in the program if you didn't get a chance to get it down the first time it went by. Gordon was a little quick with that, perhaps. Right now, we're going to take you away on the second part of our tour of Bell Labs. And this time, you'll need to fasten your seat belts. Hello, Jesse. Hi, David. Welcome to AT&T Bell Labs. Thank you very much. Let me introduce you to Lizette and Michelle. Hi, Lizette. Hi, Michelle. So this is our cellular test band. This is how we test our new technology at AT&T Bell Laboratories in terms of cellular communications. Why don't you hop in? I'll give you a spin. Our first stop was not a typical laboratory. But this test ban is where much of the preliminary uh, of research course, uh, on cellular uh, phones gets applied to real-life situations. Our guide was Jesse Russell, Research and Development Director for Cellular Radio Systems. Once we got on the road, we couldn't wait to test a cellular phone ourselves. How about a phone call? Is there anybody you want to uh, call? Um, our teacher. You want to call your teacher? I think yeah. we can manage that. All better. righty, why don't you uh, give that a try? Let me see if I can punch her up for you. Hello. Hello. Hi. 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 
How's <laughs> everything? Everything is fine. Where are you? Uh, we're in a van um, <laughs> doing some science, actually, uh, studying cellular phones. How's that for a cover? <laughs> <laughs> well, the phone call worked, but how did it work? Well, David, basically the way cellular works is that there are many, many transmitting towers that are spread over a geographical area. If you look out the window, you would see an example of one of the towers. Oh, yeah, there's an, a tall antenna tower there. You see that, Lizette? Yeah. Transmitter towers like these are planted throughout a geographical area. As the cellular phone moves around an area, the call is switched without interruption among these transmitters, depending on which one can provide the best signal. Okay, so this is the current technology that we have available. What can we look forward to in the future? What we're moving toward now, David, is to build telephones that can be placed on people as opposed to in places. Right you mean in like Dick Tracy watches? Very similar to Dick Tracy watches. Today, where our technology is, sort of in the decade of the 90s, is that we will be putting very small phones in your shirt pocket or in your purse or what have you. So these two young ladies could have telephones in their earrings, in their not necklaces? Quite, right? No, <laughs> the technology is not at that point. My next stop was the Bell Labs facility in Homedale, New Jersey, where I met up with Jessica, Evan, and Tops. We set out to see the office of the future. Sid Ahuja and his team have created a conferencing system that will make business meetings a multimedia event, all from your own office. Now, it's hard to think of a telephone, a video camera, and a computer as being very futuristic. But this new system will combine all of these methods of sending messages, plus machines like faxes and VCRs, into one computer program. And even though the phone, camera, and the computer don't look connected, they're connected in the back for the network and by another piece of hardware that makes it all behave as if one. We got to do some office messaging of our own, with Tux and me in one office, and Jessica and Evan down the hall. Hi, guys. Hi, Tux. We played with, oh, I mean, we experimented with one of the most fun components, the ability to write or draw messages to each other. We're not done yet. Fun. Evan, is that you or uh, Jessica there? So we've got Evan going now. Okay. Now, we could do the same thing as we're doing with the picture with a printed document. We could both edit at the same time. Indeed so. Because, as I said, this has now become a program, and the program could take a printed document or even a program that's in the computer and you could now work on it together. That's the whole idea. The computer is allowing you to do this in real time. This is not like fax where you take a picture and say, I'm going to send it to the other friend. He's going to do something and send it back to you. You're doing this in real life. That means you're doing it at the same time he's watching and he's doing the same time as you're watching. And the whole idea is we're trying to make it look like face-to-face -face meetings. <laughs> Hold on. Don't you like it? No, I don't. I don't know. No, I don't think so. <laughs> I want to go to Chicago. Please specify your flight number. Hmm, sounds like Sam the robot must have gotten a job as an airline reservationist. Please specify your flight number. Here in the Speech Recognition Research Lab, Jay Wilpon is trying to figure out how a computer can learn to recognize every word spoken by anyone in the world. Right now, Jay is experimenting with an airline reservation program. The machine knows a couple hundred words and can recognize 12 billion sentences. But for now, only when it's Jay's voice. I want to leave on Tuesday morning. United Airlines Flight 3 leaves New York LaGuardia at 10 a.m., arrives in Chicago O'Hare at 11.18 a.m. Just okay. doing speech recognition is only part, but understanding what I mean by morning and go to, what do those concepts mean, is a whole other part of the system. It's something called natural language processing. And we have to be able to teach the machine to besides recognizing, to understand. Your reservation on United Airlines Flight 3 to Chicago O'Hare on Tuesday is confirmed. Thank you for using AT&T. So I actually booked myself a flight. Um, hopefully the tickets won't arrive because <laughs> I don't really want to go to Chicago. Right. Once only the stuff of science fiction, lasers are now used in everything from medical devices to compact discs to grocery store checkouts. And scientists like Jack Jewell are taking lasers where they have never gone before. A chip it's full of lasers? A chip full of lasers. Looks like a tiny piece of metal to me. It's, a, it's, it's very small. You can see that because it has about 150,000 lasers on it. Whoa. Of course, You're I counted them exactly. Right. Yes, yes. <laughs> You're saying there's 150,000 lasers on that little chip? Yes.
I guess we'll have to take his word for it since we couldn't count them for ourselves. What we were looking at but couldn't see were some of the world's smallest lasers. These microscopic lasers could revolutionize fiber optics in the same way small transistors revolutionized microelectronics. And the hope is to make these already tiny lasers even smaller still. So you get 300,000 instead of 150,000. Oh, yes, on a smaller chip. We used to have a million on a chip, but then we broke it up into little pieces. And somewhere along the line, someone will knock on your door and say, I've got a use for your 150,000 lasers. <laughs> <laughs> I'll probably have to knock on their door. OK. <laughs> One use for these tiny lasers is in an optical computer, a computer that runs on light. It was invented by Alan Huang, the head of the optical computing research department at Bell Labs. Alan is a man with a vision, and a man with an invention that may indeed push us farther beyond the information age than we ever imagined. He's also someone who thinks about science in some rather unconventional ways. When we visited him, he had us all trying to balance eggs. One of the elements of trying to do science is there's a point that you're going to look stupid. It's yeah, all right. <laughs> oh my God, you know, that's great. There's no salt or anything like that. Have you well, been practicing? <laughs> loads. He folded paper airplanes. Well, the shape of this computer should be really in the shape of the airplane because then the data and everything can flow exactly what it's supposed to, like the wind flows over the wings of the airplane. He told us about his dreams. And one time I woke up and it was like, oh my God, they didn't collide. And so I started thinking, maybe there is an answer to this problem. Alan Wong may get his answers in some rather unconventional ways, but he's got some pretty practical ideas about where this sort of research may lead us, from computer images that we can actually touch to multi-screen football games where the viewer controls the shots. Well, obviously, as a researcher, you also are characterizing yourself as a futurist to some degree. How far in the future is that football game for us? Well, think? this is what's so frustrating because a lot of things are technically possible. It's a question of whether you're willing to pay for it, or it's a question of which way you, the society wants to push something. Uh -huh. And I think this is one of the reasons why it's important for people to understand more about science, because they're going to have to make these choices. You know, what do you want to do? Do you want to have, uh, quote, uh, you know, multi-screen football games? Or do you want to have supercomputers that are better for medicine or something? You're going to have to start being educated to make these choices. From balancing eggs to optical computing, only at Bell Labs. Now, we've been relaying questions to the audience here and to those of you in your classrooms and at home that we've received from the AT&T Learning Network. And I thought it'd be pretty important right now if we uh, took a closer look at that. I had the opportunity a week ago or so to join some students in a school where they're using that system. In order to find out more about AT&T's Learning Network, I decided to go to the source, a school that's been using the network for almost two years now, Hammershold Middle School. And, of course, if I want to talk to folks at the source, I talk to the students who are the primary users of that system. Here, we've got a group of sixth grade students who work with the computer. My understanding is that this network connects your school with other schools. Is it just around the U.S. or does it go international? It goes international and we also communicate with states in the U.S. Well, I'll tell you one thing you guys have all done is get me excited about the process. Uh, Rick, do you think you can uh, show me how to use the computer and maybe sure. I can send a message to Paris? Sure. Terrific. Let's go. All right, everybody, this is where it happens, right around the computer terminal. You can tell by the cluster of kids. Okay. All right, Robin, what's on the screen right now? We're going to check um, what's coming in now, what came in for us. Oh, so if there's any messages, right? Right. OK, let's find out. In a matter of seconds, Robin calls up her electronic mail. First message is from Ontario, Canada. The subject is crops. Hi, Learning Circle Partners. Concerning Ontario's crops, those are Canada's. We cannot the AT&T Learning Network links groups of students from schools in different locations. These learning circles explore the same curriculum together. Some groups study social, political, and economic issues, and others enhance writing skills and different forms of self-expression. From what I can see, these kids are getting a great head start to becoming real pros with electronic mail. I've learned that electronic mail is much easier and faster than regular mail. I like electronic mail because I've never dealt with people overseas before. 
Using this is better than having a regular pen pal because you get your messages back quicker. Even if I send my electronic letter overseas, it, it gets there the next day. That's really amazing. A wonderful system, obviously. If you're a classroom teacher and you and your students would like to join the AT&T Learning Network, there's a number that you can call. It should be showing up on your screen right now. It's 1-800-367-7225. And there's an extension number, and you need to dial that extension. It's 4158. Arno, thanks so much for joining us thank today you. on the show. It's been a real pleasure. I want to thank all the students and teachers who joined us. In particular, I guess I want to thank their principals for allowing them to take a field trip with us here at Bell Labs. Um, I also want to thank uh, all of you who have joined us uh, in your classrooms uh, over the air and the satellite. Uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you again, perhaps, on a future program of this nature. If you've got uh, questions or comments about the show, there will be an address that shows up here at the end that you can write to us. We'd like to hear from you. We'd like to know what you're doing for Science and Technology Week in your own community. And we'd like to know what your ideas about the future of science and technology might be. Again, thanks to all of you here from Bell Labs and live from AT&T Bell Laboratories. From Murray Hill, New Jersey, by satellite, this has been live from AT&T Bell Laboratories, the National Science and Technology Week open house. For a copy of the Library of Congress reading list or the Our World, Our Role environmental report, send your request to live from AT&T Bell Laboratories, 101 JFK Parkway, Short Hills, New Jersey, 07078. For a free Take It Back information wheel with facts and tips on recycling in the home, call 1-800-9-YAKITY. Also call this number for a copy of the Yakity Yak video, which was produced by the nonprofit Take It Back Foundation and costs $9.95 plus shipping and handling and is billable to major credit cards. Please have your parents call for either of these items. And the next time you're in New York City, come by and meet Gordon explore the world of communication science at the AT&T InfoQuest Center on Madison Avenue and 56th Street. Thank you for joining us today for Live from AT&T Bell Laboratories.